So you've had a win this week, as you said, with this National Reconstruction Fund getting established through that, the Senate, got the legislation getting through. But how much will this change manufacturing in this country, given it's not a scheme of grants with this $15 billion put mm. away? It's equity and loan guarantees and the like. I think that's a really good question because it's going to take a lot to get us off the mat. We're ranked as some of the lowest uh, OECD, well, amongst the lowest OECD nations for manufacturing self-sufficiency. We've had a decade of neglect under the former Liberal government and we are trying to rebuild and revitalise manufacturing at a time where we've been dependent on concentrated or broken supply chains. We've got the sort of geopolitical environment we're operating in where we do need to reduce those dependencies. And so this is an investment. This is a layer of capital for firms that are finding it hard right now to get that investment support in the climate that we're in. We need, across key priority areas that are outlined by the National Reconstruction Fund, to rebuild in the national interest. And so we are going to work on delivering that layer of capital and do it in a way that's different to the way of doing business under the Liberal Party, which has been colour-coded spreadsheets determining grants based on political interest, not national interest. Well, just on that... Yep. Mr Husick, just, just on that, tell me how this scheme works. Do you have the final decision-making power over all this? I've noticed that criticism levelled at me by the Liberal Party saying that I've got all this power as a minister wrong. I mean, they haven't looked at the detail. We deliberately set up this $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund to be managed by an independent board. There will not be colour-coded spreadsheets. The board will make decisions about allocating loans, equity guarantees, just like the Clean Energy Financing Corporation has for 10 years plus. Uh, and it will be targeted to priority areas in the economy where we need to revitalise manufacturing. So it's not about me as a minister. It's about an independent board. It's not about political interest. It's about national interest. OK, on the safeguards mechanism, the government was celebrating that this week, the passage through the Senate. But how can you guarantee this measure will not drive up costs for consumers? Well, I think it's looking at something that the Liberal Party put in place when they were in government to drive down emissions. They had this mechanism in place, but they never cared to actually make it work. We've said we've got to reduce our emissions by 43... You know, get to that 43% by 2030 mark. Uh, this will target those 215 uh, of the heaviest emitters, get them to get on a pathway to reduce, uh, reduce their, their emissions... And it's not targeted in the way that the Liberal Party scare campaign uh, suggested of driving up costs, but it's with working with industry. If they do well, they can obviously reduce their emissions. And if they've got trouble in doing so, they can buy credits to help reduce emissions collectively. And it is a really important way in which we can work with industry to get emissions down and also see jobs go up with some of the investments that we're making as a government to help industry achieve that. And does the government give up on the Housing Australia Future Fund now? It seems that that won't pass the Senate. We are very focused on addressing housing affordability, particularly making homes available uh, to, to low-income earners, being able to uh, help others uh, secure uh, accommodation. And the Housing uh, Affordability Future Fund's a big part of that. We'll just, again, we just like we did with National Reconstruction Fund, as we did with Safeguards... We'll work with other parliamentarians, with the Greens uh, and the crossbench, if they're willing to do so. We're prepared to, to work with them. And, you know, as much as people make predictions about the fate of certain pieces of legislation, I'd, I'd actually wait until we get close to putting it before seeing what the actual result is. Uh, OK, I wanted to ask about speculation. There might be changes to the PRRT in the budget. Mm -hmm. You've previously criticised gas companies. Would you like to see such changes? an increase in tax from the gas companies? I understand why you need to ask me the question. And if you can appreciate, Andrew, I leading into a budget, I won't, won't be in a position to make announcements <laughs> pre your budget. Uh, though I All totally right. get why you ask me the question. Are we, but, but, you are know, we going again, to see something of that nature, do you think? I, I do appreciate Are we going to see something of that nature? the question in a different, different way. I'll leave that to the Treasurer. That's in his uh, ballpark right. to respond to. All right, look, um, just a couple left. How important is the voice seen in your electorate? You have a, reason, a reasonably big Aboriginal mm. population there in Chifley. Yes, I, I, I'm proud of the fact that Chifley's home to one of the largest Aboriginal, urban-based Aboriginal communities in the country, and I've just been quietly 
meeting with groups in the area, talking through what the voice means in practical terms. Uh, but there's also a huge degree of symbolism here and anyone uh, who discounts symbolism, I, I just think, don't think is being fed income. This is a chance for us to, one, recognise our First Nations people in our constitution and extend respect by consultation. People uh, get the practicality of that and also the symbolic significance of that as well. And so uh, there is this period of time before the referendum uh, gets called by the Prime Minister to work with people, not just Aboriginal communities, but the broader community as well, to explain what this all means, why it's important, and why the scare campaign and the negativity being put up by the Liberal and National parties just doesn't stack up. And just finally, should the Reserve Bank pause on interest rates this Tuesday? Well, I think, uh, obviously, one, we've, we always stress the independence of the Reserve Bank. We would you know, clearly get them to take on board uh, the impact of the interest rate rises that they've uh, authorised up until this point, and they'll make that, that uh, call. Uh, ultimately, there is some suggestion that they are taking note of that. I'll leave it to them. I don't, as a Cabinet Minister, need to be jawboning them on that point. But uh, I think what we are trying to do is rein in inflation, make sure through things like the National Reconstruction Fund we address the supply chain issues that have been largely responsible in terms of driving inflation. We need to put downward pressure on interest rates. That's what we're trying to do as an Australian government. And if at any point the Liberal and National parties want to cooperate, and work with us on that instead of being negative and saying no all the time. I think that will be a welcome development as well. There is some signs of that. I, I saw some suggestion that the Liberal Party is prepared to work with Treasurer Chalmers on the future of the Reserve uh, Bank and the review that's being done into it. And all I can do is encourage that type of behaviour if it is to, uh, to continue, if that is the actual case. Let's see more of it. Australian people want mature, Government. They want parliamentarians working together on the nation's problems. Let's see if that actually happens as a result of the Aston by-election. Mm. Ed Husick, thanks for your time this morning. Good on you, Andrew.